Hello, my name is Christopher Aitkins. I'm a diabetes specialist podiatrist. Today I'd like to speak to you about offloading the diabetic foot. So the key principle to offloading the diabetic foot is to reduce pressure which causes ulceration. Due to changes in neuropathy, the diabetic foot is prone to high loads of pressure through the metatarsal heads and under the plantar styloid process. This is because of neuropathic and uh, motor neuropathy changes. Autonomic neuropathy changes means that the plantar fat pad and soft tissues are more susceptible to breakdown. The first method of offloading I would like to talk about is a total contact cast. This cast is made from a combination of scotch cast and soft cast and is designed to stabilise and immobilise the diabetic foot. These are most effective in the management of diabetic charcoal arthropathy as well as plantar pressure ulcers across the first to fifth metatarsal heads and plant the styloid process. However, they can be used for other complicated pressure related ulcers that are difficult to manage in other ways. These work by increasing the surface area of the foot in contact with the ground, spreading the load through the entire lower limb and away from the area of ulceration. The rigidity of the material means that the ankle and forefoot rockers are isolated during the gait cycle. Although, although these items are effective at reducing plantar pressure, they are no substitute for completely immobilizing the limb and not bearing weight through that. So the advice to patients in these devices are always reduce weight bearing as this is the best way to minimize force through the foot. As an alternative to a total contact cast, an air cast boot can be used. This works along the same principle. Inflatable cells grip the leg and translate the force from the foot and through the whole surface area of the lower limb. However, these devices are removable and as such are less effective. Research has found that patients remove these devices and continue to walk without them. Air cast boots that are made irremovable can be as effective as total contact casts. Diabetic patients who have chronic long-term injuries are often immobile and either lie in bed with their feet elevated or sit with their feet on leg rests. This can cause heel ulceration. Posterior heel ulceration in particular is difficult to resolve. The most effective method for this can be a prof or boot. These boots are designed to cradle the heel remove the pressure from that area and distribute it throughout the rest of the lower limb. They can be used for minimal transfer weight bearing but aren't designed for walking. If the ulceration extends to the plantar surface of the heel a different device will be needed. A heel offloading sandal which has a thick platform sole with a cutout at the heel is designed to reduce the pressure during weight bearing. As the heel strikes the ground, the heel rocker works to bring the forefoot to the ground. The thick sole and the cutout at the heel means that the ground reaction force is translated away from the heel towards the midfoot into the forefoot. These work best when patients are weight bearing, but we have seen some good results in patients who sit in wheelchairs. For patients with ulceration to the toes, a forefoot rocker can be used. This is the reverse to the heel rocker, where the thick sole travels from the heel to the MPJs. It is removed around that area to allow the final rocker, the MPJ rocker during gait, to be isolated. No load is transferred beyond the head of the MPJs, therefore ground reaction force and pressure is reduced. For patients with Functional hallux limiters or hallux limiters, ulceration is often seen under the first IPJ. This is because as we progress through gait, 
Dorsiflexion at the MPJ should normally occur but is restricted. It is translated forward to the IPJ where we see hyperextension and increased loading. In order to minimise the pressure in this area, a slipper cast can be used. This is a removable rigid device that's casted to the patient's foot and restricts hyperextension at the IPJ, therefore reducing ground reaction force under the area and allowing the ulcer to heal. Diabetic shark arthropathy requires patients to be offloaded on average between 9 to 12 months. It is best practice to use total contact casts. However, air cast boots can be used, but these are less effective. The duration of treatment often leaves patients a little bit downhearted and dejected. Once the shark was settled, the deformity will need to be managed with orthotic footwear and insoles. Total contact insoles can be used to effectively minimise the risk of real serration and reoccurrence of shark arthropathy. However, they are less effective when being used to treat such conditions. Um, hi Chris, thanks for um, taking some time to talk to us today about a very important concept which is the um, offloading of the diabetic foot. Uh, I found it quite fascinating when you look at um, management of di diabetes foot problems, when you actually link that with understanding the, um, the physics um, behind the, the problem. Um, how does the understanding of the biomechanics of the foot help you as a podiatrist to inform treatment? So, for me, it's the basis of everything that we do. Um, the foot is permanently in contact with the ground when we walk and is responsible for locomotion and taking us forward. Um, everything can kind of be summed up in two equations, essentially. Force equals mass times acceleration. So that's the amount of us, of the, of the body that's there and how we propel that. That needs to generate the force and the pressure within the foot is a function of force over area. So the mass stays constant, the acceleration is relatively constant. We always have to move and we have to propel that forward. We can influence and alter the way that the, the surface area of the foot and the contact area of the foot. And we can also, in patients who have feet that can be manipulated, manipulated and moved, we can use insoles to help offload shift pressure and load and um, the term offloading is the one that's used commonly but we don't really offload the foot we, we just try and move the pressure we redistribute we, it, don't we? yes we redistribute the pressure and redistribute the load yeah. as opposed to offload the foot okay how how do you think understanding the gait cycle um would also help when you are assessing a, a foot also or a charcoal foot how does that help you to understand how that also had happened? Yeah, if it, you make a decision on what type of offloading I need to use. Yes, definitely. So the gait cycle follows very distinct patterns. We've got three rockers in the foot moving forward in the sagittal plane. We've got the heel rocker that brings the foot to the ground. Yeah. We've got the ankle rocker that takes the weight of the leg forward through the ankle joint. And then we've got the forefoot rocker, the MPJ, the first MPJ in them um, two to five that then pivots us forward yep. as we propel. Understanding that, we can think about when the ulceration occurred during the gait cycle, what that load was at the time, and what abnormality we can see based on the changes in the musculoskeletal system, whether we've got weakness, um, tightness and restriction in structures, changes in the foot shape, particularly in diabetes because of motor neuropathy, and then we can help overcome that alter that and manage the pathology that's present. Once you've got an ulcer or many previous ulcers, once you've got surgery or an abnormal foot because of previous charcoal, the whole biomechanics tend to change quite significantly. How, how do you assess that? 
that's a tricky question. How do I how do we assess that? Um, I guess it's a combination of tacit knowledge, and when all else fails, return to the basics of force, pressure, and load, and observing how gait occurs. The even in a deformed foot, in a, a, a significantly deformed foot, we still have to weight bear. The foot has to touch the ground. Prominent areas, if they are fixed and won't move or or deflect the pressure, must be offloaded. If we can't, if the, once the foot becomes rigid, there isn't a lot of manipulation we can do. We can't change the function. We can't alter the way that that foot loads as it walks through gate, as it progresses through the gate cycle. So then we start to rely on the idea of increasing the surface area. So we make insoles that are cushioned larger, softer, so that when the foot sinks into them, it can deform, they can spread the load a little bit more. We try and alter things like the contact time. So ulceration is more a function of the pressure time integral. So the amount of pressure for the time that the pressure is there. So if we can try and alter that slightly, then we can reduce the re the risk of recurrent ulceration. However, patients, once they have an ulcer, are at risk of having secondary ulcers and they will be in generally the same site because those are the sites of vulnerability. So apart from clinical assessment, when you see these patients, there are some, there are some fancy ways that we can assess uh, pressure and pressure areas and where is the maximum intensity of that pressure. Do you want to give us, give us a couple of so, ideas on that? Yeah, the, there's some complex computer-based systems which um, look at everything you want to look at for pressure and force, how it moves through the foot, when it's, when it's in certain areas and how long for and the intensity of that, which are excellent, which can be used well, and I have used clinically in the past, but they are very time-consuming and expensive to buy and maintain. Similarly, you can buy, there's old products like a Harris Beath mat, or now there's carbon fiber sheets where you get a patient to stand on that and the carbon fiber or the ink from the Harris Beath mat transfers onto a sheet of paper and you can see where the areas of high pressure are. Clinically, I'd like to use a lipstick on an area of high pressure just to see when that hits the floor if that's loading up in the insole and the footwear that we provided to make sure that that's offloaded effectively, it's it's a, it's a relatively easy clinical tool to use um, to, to mark the area that you suspect is high pressure um, and see how your device has altered that. Similarly, there's no, there's no replacement really for observing the areas of callus. Areas of callus, wear marks on the shoes, wear marks on the insoles, all give us signs of where both pressure increase, torsions occurring, and shear forces. We, we can use those quite effectively if we know the, know the signs that we're looking out for. Thank you very much. No, oh, you're welcome.